Travis Fowler was caught in the To Catch a Predator sting located at Bowling Green, Kentucky. He was 34 years of age at the time and believed he was talking to a 13-year-old female. Over the course of this video, we will dissect his chat log with the perverted justice decoy, his confrontation with Chris Hansen, and the police interrogation that follows. The chat log is a short one that only spans a few hours. Throughout it, his words are difficult to interpret, either due to intoxication or a generally poor ability to construct sentences, and it doesn't take very long before the conversation turns explicit and sexual in nature. Starting from the first page, let's take a look at some key points of interest throughout it. Travis starts the conversation one message after saying hello with, you like casual fun? This man is focused on finding sex and doesn't waste time with pleasantries. This is further accentuated by his screen name, you want, come and get me. The decoy establishes her age as 13 and shortly after Travis sends this message, hey, I love to talk, probably pretty, but I'm 34. It appears that Travis doesn't have the strongest grasp of the written English language, as his sentences are slightly difficult to interpret. What I gather from this one is that he is saying, I would love to talk to you, you're probably very pretty, but I'm 34, the age gap will not work. As we move further down the page, Travis acknowledges that he knows what he wants to discuss with the child is illegal. Quote, I don't want to get into trouble by saying the wrong thing. He also clarifies to the 13-year-old that he is only here to find casual fun and pleasure. I like to pleasure and be pleasured. I just don't chat. I meet. That's why chatting like you doesn't work for me. It's boring. If we are to pull what he just said apart, Travis is stating that he won't meet with this child not because he or anyone else could cause psychological harm, but because it is illegal. He can get into trouble, like a naughty child, but doesn't acknowledge why this act could get one into trouble in the first place. I would like to believe that another adult in a similar situation, who may be looking for a sexual encounter and stumbles across a child, would not even explain to the child what it is they are there for. They would acknowledge the young person's age and then respectfully move along, not answering any more messages from them. But Travis did not do that. He wants to talk about sex. He's in a sexually charged mental state, and this child will not do because it's illegal, therefore boring to him. The amount that this says about his character is enormous, and could be talked about for a while, but for timeliness sake, to summarize, Travis displays qualities of someone who has little empathy and is highly selfish, he sets the conversation up to go down a path of callous disregard for the person's well-being that he is talking to. By both shaming the decoy for not being able to entertain him and dropping cryptic messages for the child to interpret about what it is he is looking for, Travis is implanting the seed in the child's mind for a sexual conversation to occur. The final thing that interests me on this first page is a question that Travis responds to. The child asks him if he is afraid to meet up with people from online, to which his response is, no, I see they do, same thing, we all okay, with it's a thing adults do. Setting aside that this is one of the most poorly constructed sentences that I have ever read, I think he is trying to normalize his behavior here to the child, letting the child know that everyone he speaks to usually all engage in this sort of activity and that it is very pleasurable for all involved. Everyone consents and everyone wants it. Whether you think that looking for regular sexual encounters online is normal or not is besides the point. What consenting adults do behind closed doors is entirely up to their discretion, and that is a right that we should all respect. Yet when a person tries to bring a child's existence into the realm of understanding of what happens in the sexual corners of their mind, then they have severely lost their way at some point in their life. The conversation very quickly turns to a sexually explicit nature. And even though this should come as no surprise, I still find it very jarring to read. Near the beginning of the page, there are a few minutes of silence from Travis, and the decoy mentions that he seems busy. Travis uses this opportunity to again cryptically explain why he is busy. He mentions that he is trying to find some fun, and then says in a way that I can only assume is a low-key brag, that he will be getting some fun this weekend. Why the child needs that information, I will never know. After a small back and forth, he explains that fun does actually mean sex, 
And then very quickly, we get the romance-infused sentence. When you have sex, it will be too big to go in your part you pee from. I cannot even begin to imagine to put myself in a headspace where saying this sort of thing to a child seems appropriate, a good idea. It just doesn't compute. From this point on, Travis will go on to enlighten her about things like the need for condoms and the different ways one can perform sexual acts. He also loses himself in a tangent for a brief moment, thinking about the taut properties of her genitalia. By this point, the conversation is disgusting. There is no turning back, and Travis has fully solidified his title as Predator, which then leads us to a crunch moment. Out of everything Travis has written across these pages, I view this one small sentence as the most revealing of his personality, if it is taken on face value. After a brief, yet very graphic, sexually charged few lines, he says, Gosh, I think I feel like I want to talk. I'm in two minds about the sincerity of this statement. He is either shocked at himself, taken aback at his own desire to fantasize and openly talk about sexual topics with a minor, or it is a sly, manipulative technique, employed to make the child trust him more. He has stated that he doesn't wish to talk to this person because it's illegal, and that he would like to talk to her if it weren't. He also has made it very clear that he is looking for sex. So saying this line could feign vulnerability, possibly to make the minor feel more sympathetic towards the difficult situation that he seems to think that he is in. With all that said though, I don't think Travis is the sort to be able to plan and manipulate on that level. It is very plausible that he may understand what he is doing on an emotionally intelligent level, and that showing this side of himself could help the minor be more comfortable with opening up to him sexually. This statement is possibly him being shocked at his own want to talk to the minor, then putting that sentiment on display, because on a subconscious level he knows that doing so will help the young girl feel comfortable with talking to him. No pun intended, but Travis is absolutely a predator on the hunt for sexual prey. The minor up to this point has been a little distraction to his main goal, a forbidden fruit in his hunt for a meal. But with this sentence, he has revealed that the attention has now refocused on her. He has found his prey for the night as he plans to see how far he can take this young child on an illegal journey. The following pages of chat log are what I would class as your generic predator chatter. Travis is trying to figure out the logistics of how this sexual encounter may work, who lives in the house with the child, when they wouldn't be home, and so forth. It's also rife with sexually charged subject matter. For example, at one point Travis is very interested to know the penis size of the decoy's previous boyfriend. Another example would be his desire for the decoy to send him pictures of herself, offering photos of his penis in return. Amongst this chatter, it is interesting to note that he tells the decoy he is not looking for anything serious as he is divorced. I find this to be such a strange thing to tell a 13 year old, and it really displays Travis's complete inability to remotely think outside of his own selfish bubble. A child of 13 years of age, I think, would have very little understanding of what getting attached to a person in a romantic way would feel like, let alone being able to prevent that attachment from happening. The fact that Travis feels he needs to bring this up with a 13-year-old girl truly shows the oblivious nature of his approach to this situation. Something else that I found of interest, which only occurs twice throughout the chat, is that he gets interrupted whilst chatting with the decoy, requiring him to go silent. The first time he says it was his cousin, and the second time a friend. We will discuss this further later on during the police interrogation, but there is strong evidence to suggest that these people were actually his significant other. As the chat progresses, we have more generic predator talk, where the how and when of a meetup would take place are discussed. The decoy says that her mother will be out of town on the weekend, and Travis initially proposes a 5am meetup time. I couldn't imagine a better time that a young teen may want to go on a date with an older man. He also makes it very clear that he will be having sex with this person when they meet up, producing this brilliant sentence from Travis in the process. I want to have pleasure. I really don't want that happen a bunch. No strings fun. No calling. 
Just first, big man, dick, sex, for ya. Let's try to translate that, shall we? I want to experience sexual pleasure with you, but I really don't want this to be an ongoing thing. I'd like to have no strings attached fun, so please don't get attached. Don't call me all the time. I'd just like to be able to be the first grown man that you sleep with. Let's move on, shall we? After probing the decoy about possible nosy neighbors, they settle on a time and date to meet. And now, after spanning only a short three hours, the conversation is drawing to an end. Travis confirms that the decoy will delete her chat logs, as he is paranoid anyone may find out what they discussed. And then they exchange pleasant goodnights. Yet before he leaves, in true predator fashion, he does manage to get one more sexual comment in before confirming yet again that the decoy won't talk about this experience with anyone. And just like that, it is over. This chat log is a push and pull within Travis's aroused mind, between his paranoia surrounding the logistics of the scenario and his desire to make this fantasy come to life. He seems to have zero moral conflict that he expresses to the decoy anyway, about actually having sex with a minor and the possible implications this could have on her for the rest of her life. This now brings us to the confrontation with Chris Hansen. Before we begin, I'd like to point out the way Travis enters the house. When I first watched this, it didn't strike me as anything too out of the ordinary, but after multiple views, it dawned on me that these two people have never met before. The way he enters the house is very cold, how someone may enter the house of a family member that they are not excited to see, or to go to a grocery store to get supplies that they don't want to get. When most people meet someone for the first time, there is excitement, smiles, and some sort of attempt to build rapport. Not here though. He enters the house, looking up only to scout the surroundings, and follows the decoy with pace. It's very eerie. How are you? Good, how was your drive? Okay. It was okay? Look at this, we got these sweet new chairs, sit down. It's so cool, it has like a massager in it. The decoy asks Travis to sit down, and his little nose scratch leads me to believe that this makes him very uncomfortable. Travis is likely very nervous at this point. He knows what he's doing is wrong, and he wants to get it over and done with. He's been driving for around two hours, and I can only assume he's been replaying how this is going to work over and over in his mind. So when the decoy asks him to sit down, this goes against his plan, and we can see the visible discomfort he is in by following her command. Okay. It was okay? Yeah. Look at this, we got these sweet new chairs, sit down. It's so cool, it has like a massager in it. If you push those buttons. Yeah. Huh. You feel it? Yeah. That's pretty cool, right? That's wild. <laughs> this moment could be highly relatable for many, if not for the disturbing nature of the scenario. A moment when a person puts their vulnerable side on display and makes a gesture to close the physical barrier between them and another party they are interested in. Whether this be a first kiss by a lake, or holding hands for the first time after dinner, it is a difficult move to make, as the possibility of rejection is ever present. Although, whether a person is to be rejected or not, one would hope that you never find yourself in the situation that Travis is in right now. Watch as Travis decides to throw caution to the wind, and attempt to embrace the decoy. He wants to break that physical barrier, as he needs to get behind it so that his sexual plan can progress. You will notice that he lets out a breath whilst doing so, as if to release the tension that has been building up in his troubled mind. I cannot express enough how thankful I am that Chris Hansen is just around the corner to defuse this situation. So what's up? Do you want me to get you something to drink? Hey, Jim, have a seat right away. What's happening? Please sit down. What's going on? Will you tell me? I thought it was never going to happen. You thought what? I thought this was never going to happen. You thought this is never going to happen? Yeah. And what do you think this is? It's not, it's not good. It's not good? Yeah. Now, what was your plan here tonight? Have a, have a, have a, fun, a time. Have a fun time? Yeah. With a girl who told you she was how old? 
I think it was uh, 13. 13. Yeah. And how old are you? 34. 34. Yeah. And how far did you travel tonight? About an hour and 42 minutes. An hour and 42 there. minutes. You came from where? Murfreesboro. Murfreesboro. And during that drive at all, did you think, man, this was a bad idea? Yeah, that's exactly what I thought. Exactly what you thought. Should have turned around. Should have thought about it. Should have turned around. What we just witnessed was an onslaught of questions from Hansen. Whenever Travis responds, Chris also makes it a point of repeating the answer back to Travis, a subtle technique that subconsciously tells him that every word he speaks is being listened to carefully and being taken very seriously. Further putting Travis into a vulnerable headspace, Chris is on the attack and Travis is doing his best to defend. Up to this point, Travis has been handling himself well in the face of how confusingly confronting this must be for him. He has been answering Chris's questions quickly and honestly, but as we are about to see, he'll begin to buckle under the pressure. Now, what do you do for a living? I work in manufacturing. Business. Manufacturing? Yeah. Doing what? What do you manufacture? Um, steel. Steel. Yeah. You manufacture steel. Now, in your chat here, you seem very nervous that somebody would find out about your visit tonight. Sure. Why were you so nervous about that? I mean, you have a regular life and, you know, you just... Yeah. You just like to have fun and... and I, I, just like to have a fun with... Just like to have fun with a 13-year-old girl. Anybody. Anybody. Yeah. The line of questioning has shifted from simple to answer questions about his life to the now more difficult to answer what on earth is going on in this chat log? I find this answer in particular rather interesting. Hansen has asked him why he was so nervous about people finding out about this chat log. And Travis responded, when you have a regular life, you want to have fun with anybody. There's a few things going on here. Travis is no longer listening to what Chris is asking him. For this question and for many others, he responds as though he was asked a completely different question, which means that he has begun to construct a narrative in his mind for why he did what he did, and he's going to try sell that narrative to Chris. Secondly, I find this concept of a regular life intriguing. Is he saying that he thinks his life is regular, boring, uneventful, therefore justifying his desire to have fun with anybody who will have sex with him, legal or not? Or is he saying that Chris doesn't live a regular life and could never understand what it's like to live a regular life? So he's trying to educate Chris on how regular people seek to pass the time. Have you met other people before on the internet? Sure, because older, I mean, everybody's old, you know, that I've been, I've never done this before. You've never ever met somebody in person who you met online? What, what made you decide to do this for the first time tonight? You know, I... Wow, it crossed my mind about I seen this show and I'm like, I you, see, you see, you seen which show? This one. This show. Yeah. You've seen it before. Yeah. And what was your reaction when you when you've seen the show before? Um. It was, Mind if I sit down? It was bad. It was bad in what way? Was it was bad, just, just bad, that's bad. all I can say. The, what the people were doing was bad. Yeah. Now you say here that you like to pleasure people and be pleasured. Yeah. Now you know this is a 13-year-old girl. Yeah. Well, I would, but it's against the law. You're 13, I'm 34. You talk about how having sex for the first time may be painful for the girl. You ask her about the things she's done with her old boyfriend. When you get real brave, you can try the blank, meaning anal sex. Men love that. What made you think that this was an appropriate conversation to have? with a girl who said she was 13. I, I don't know, what, I just know that uh, my life is over, I see. 
I'd go to jail if I got caught. You know how to erase archives? Then you go through a whole list of things she should do to make sure that she erases the online conversation you had with her. Did you erase them? Don't freak, I'll be easy. Nobody around to see. Should I blanket your house, meaning have sex, or leave to go somewhere else? You have nosy neighbors that mom asks to check things out? Let's rewind this back a little. Travis is clearly in anguish here, surely reflecting on his actions and no doubtedly feeling self-pity rather than remorse. It also appears Chris probably thinks a similar thing. Watch as Chris observes Travis in his wounded state and chooses to continue reading from the chat log instead of letting up. He digs deeper when he could have easily stopped and we see that this hits Travis hard. Freak, I'll be easy. Nobody around to see. Should I blanket your house, meaning have sex, or leave to go somewhere else? You have nosy neighbors that mom asks to check things out? Chris seems to approach every predator differently. Sometimes he has more of an understanding approach, and other times he is a cold-hearted killer. That's you then, right there? And then you sent these pictures. I mean, do you do that often? Send pictures of yourself naked to other people? I have sex, man. I just, I just enjoy it, and I shouldn't have done that. But well, what's going on in your life that made you do this tonight? Explain that to me. Uh, it's not a first time thing. I guess. First time thing. Yeah. Now you've seen the show before, so you've probably heard other men tell me it's their first time. Uh, that that is, it's true. And, and do you suppose everybody's telling me the truth? I don't know about them. It's not me. But help me to understand why tonight, for the first time, you decided to chat up a girl who said she was 13, send her naked photos of yourself, and then come over here for a sexual liaison. It's an approach. I'm sorry? It's an approach, and, and that's all I can say. It's, it's an approach? Yeah, that's all I can say. What do you mean by that? Great question, Chris. I wonder what he means by that. I'm pretty sure he's got a good explanation for this one. But basically, that's, that's all I can say. I just all you can say. It's an approach. Did you bring anything with you tonight? Condoms? Yeah. You did. Anything else? So you're just going to hang out here with a 13-year-old girl in this big old nice house? I didn't know what it was, what it was, or anything, so... What do you think should happen to you? Huh. You say here you're a country boy from Carolina trying to make it. You a musician? You are a musician. I mean, no, I will never ever be anything now. I mean, well, don't you think that this means you need some help or something? Means that huh, I will never happen again. I know that. Never happen be, again. I won't be doing anything but sitting in jail, I guess. You ever been in trouble before? You have been? Yeah. A and, girl showed me a... And what happened? I don't... Well, I don't tell know me. We're going to check the record. We're going to find oh, out. You might as well tell me. I mean, just... She had a, a fake ID and... She got in trouble, and, and I got uh, some things happened in Delaware. And, you some know, things happened in Delaware? Yeah, I mean. So you, you had a you had a sexual encounter with an underage girl in Delaware? Yeah, but it really never got with that far. And how far did it get? As far as I seen that, it was just, I was just where I was, and that was it. But basically, I mean. 
So Chris has just asked how far did it get, in reference to Travis's previous conviction for sexual conduct with a minor, and I'm still on the fence whether the response is genius or idiocy. Maybe both. I suppose quite often genius and idiocy do go hand in hand. Travis says, I was just where I was and that was it. A perfectly obtuse way to say nothing with an attempt to shut down the line of questioning. If a teacher asks you why were you late to class, or a parent says why didn't you come home last night, maybe a police officer is inquiring about your whereabouts on the night of a crime, I wonder the reaction if you were to say, I was just where I was and that was it, but basically, I mean, I don't really, I didn't even feel about it. the other parts, you know what I mean? Well, I, but what was the actual criminal charge against you? Having sex with a minor. Having sex with a minor, okay. Yeah. So you had sex with a minor. Um, I was charged with it, but I, I didn't do it myself, I mean. So you got charged with a crime you didn't commit? You know what I'm saying? I was, I was, uh, You're saying she had an ID that yeah, made you think that she was older than she was? Yeah. And how old did the ID say she was? 18. 18. And how old was she really? 17. 17. Yeah. And how old were you at the time? 22, I think. I'm from Australia, so forgive my ignorance, as the legal age to purchase and drink alcohol is 18. Isn't the legal age for alcohol consumption in America 21? Why would a 17-year-old need a fake ID that says she's 18? What good would that do? I did a quick Google search and discovered that at 18 years of age, and an American can legally get tattoos and piercings, vote, they can enlist in the military, they can buy fireworks and spray paint, they can buy a pet, and they can make medical decisions. So unless this 17 year old was desperate to vote or buy a guinea pig, or maybe she wanted to head straight into the military after her encounter with Travis, I really don't see why she would have this fake ID. Also, he was 22 years old and he asked to see the ID of someone who told him she was 18. I find this hard to believe. I would hone in on this statement a little more, but I'll let the police officers do that in the interrogation coming up. And you got in trouble for that? She must have been younger than 17. I, I, I don't really know. I really don't. And another thing, for someone who hasn't had any trouble with the law, he sure doesn't remember a lot of details about the one time he got a criminal conviction. I've not had much trouble with the law, and whether that means I'm a good citizen or lucky, I'll leave up to your imagination. What I will say though, is the small amount of times that I have been in trouble for minor driving offences, I remember the details like they were yesterday. I remember how old I was, how fast I was driving, and how hot the weather was. I even remember where I was driving to and from. It could just be the way my mind experiences these sort of things, but confrontations of a legal nature seem to be memorable. I find it hard to believe that Travis remembers so few details about this moment in his life. In his defense though, up to this point he has been rather honest. He hasn't outright lied like so many other predators do, and to a degree he has taken some responsibility and ownership for being in this house. It is quite possible that he just doesn't remember the details about this criminal conviction. That being said, I do find this section of the interview to be one of the few parts where he is actively evading Chris's questions. And understandably so. The man has just been caught red-handed trying to do what is universally classed as one of the most vile things a human can do. I can't imagine he would want to be too upfront and open about his prior convictions right now. Now is that the only other time you've been in trouble? But see, when you first came in here, you told me that you had never been with an underage girl before. I have. What, what, what was well, the charge in Delaware? Well, what I'm saying is, as I wasn't thought that she was underage, but she showed ID, and I thought she was of age. Did you plead guilty to those charges, or did you go to trial, no. or how did that work? One, plead guilty to two, and it has a you know, it's, it's To two charges you pleaded guilty to, yeah. and you never went to jail on that? No. And that was in Delaware? And you ever been arrested any time other than that? No. Well, you've seen the show before, so you know that, that this is... I'd like to take a moment to appreciate the little strained sound Chris makes as he attempts to stand up and talk at the same time. So you know that, that this is... About the time where... The nature of these videos is rather heavy and definitely not for everyone. 
the subject matter is dark and when thought about from an emotional point of view is rather disturbing. Yet I, like many others, choose to watch these tapes for a multitude of reasons. Some may have a keen interest in criminal behavior or interview and interrogation tactics. There's probably a lot of people who just like watching scumbags get grilled on the barbecue. Or for some, there may be even a more personal and intimate reason for watching this. Whichever it may be, there are small moments laced within these videos that can make us laugh. And these remind me to take a step back from it all and breathe. Chris's little grunt here is one of those moments for me. Well, you've seen the show before, so you know that, that this is about the time where I need to tell you who I am. I'm Chris Hansen, and I'm with Dateline NBC, yeah. and this is To Catch a Predator. Yeah. Can I make my phone call? You, you can walk right off the door you came in. But nobody, uh, I mean, I know they're going to be out there anyway, so I need to make the phone call first. Well, I'm sure you'll be able to make a phone call. Okay. Anything else you'd like to tell us? As the producer motions to Travis to leave from the front door, Travis thinks that he is about to get arrested and has his hands behind his back. For someone who doesn't know much about law enforcement, he seems to know a lot about the processes, even earlier asking if he could have his phone call before they take him in. Watching the end of these raw interviews always leaves me with a feeling of eerie unease. The man must stand up and walk out of this unknown house surrounded by cameramen and audio equipment. His heart must be pounding. The interview with Chris is like the eye of the storm. It would be chaos in their minds before coming into the house, and it sure as hell is going to be chaos when they leave. So sitting down with Chris, it almost has a peaceful vibe to it. The only thing that I can relate this to would be times in my life where a relationship has ended. I'd be driving to their house knowing that a difficult conversation will be had. Then I have that conversation, which is a blur of words and thoughts. Then I stand up and leave the house. Unsure of what just happened, yet certain that it will have impact. Walking towards the door and beginning to realize that I may never see this person again and that my life has just changed forever. I imagine this is something similar to what Travis feels right now. Life will never be the same for him again. Just like life would never be the same for a young girl if she was actually in the house and not Chris Hansen. The first 18 minutes of the interrogation video is pretty uneventful. If you are interested in watching it in its entirety, I'll leave some links below to where you can find it. During this time, the detective attempts to build rapport with Travis by offering him water and releasing his hands. There's a bit of small talk and a few minor questions. His Miranda rights are read and Travis does not opt to have a lawyer present. Now you can start and tell me how this started or I can start asking you questions. Um, this is your opportunity to give me your side of the story. It's just basically a box either come up or I either was in the chat room myself and just... What chat room? Yahoo. Yahoo? Yeah. Just pure, just fun. That's all I wanted. And I obviously, I'd, I would have thought this somebody uh, that was in the stat state that she was would have, uh, but, but obviously not. And uh, In the state that she was, what I missed something. She wanted the fun also, you know. What what gave you that impression? The things that she, that she said. A good actor. Actress. So you are on Yahoo. Do you frequent that chat room often? I've I've been having 
pleasure with adults in my my life. Okay, pretty much a good twenty years. You know, it's nothing to that to me, but this was something different, and that's where it led to different how another experience, and that would be her first two. That's all I can say. That's all. That's all I. That's all I can come about. It's just plain and simple. It's just, that's the only truth I know. That's it. There's no no black or white. It's just one way. How old that's was it. she? I think thirteen. Okay. Now you think or you know based on your chat. I, I know. It was thirteen. Transcripts are there. That's it. <clears throat> and what were your intentions when you got here? I was intentions to be pleasurable and pleasurable, but I, I might not have done the actual pen penetration. I just I just wanted to see how it went. That's all, you know. Okay. Now you're gonna have to define pleasurable for me. And anybody else uh, who may ask me fellatio. what we're talking about. Fellatio. Having the lady have pleasure below. Mm hmm. And likewise, I guess. Okay, because the chat that I read didn't talk about much of that it talked about well, that's what I'm saying. sexual intercourse but see that's that's how that happens but that doesn't mean I was going to do it when a person is lying they tend to accentuate the parts of what they are saying that they feel will help their case they put extra thought to find the pieces of their sentence that they feel needs to be emphasized to make you believe their words if a poor liar is trying to spin a story to you I think on an instinctual level we can usually sense these cogs turning in their mind and the entire flow of the conversation has an uncomfortable feeling. I don't believe that everybody's body language is the same and that trying to interpret whether someone is lying purely based on dialogue and gestures is a flawed art, but I do think that Travis is lying here. He puts an unusual emphasis on the word do as he says, I wasn't going to do it. His face cramps into a little smile and his arms outstretch. It's cartoonish in nature and doesn't look genuine, despite his best attempts. But that doesn't mean I was going to do it, you know what I mean? So. But you hope to? Well, I was just on her how it would be, you know what I mean? Just play by, play by her ear. So, were you at your home when you were chatting with her? Yeah. Are you married? I have a girlfriend. Does she live with you? Yeah, or do you live with her? I live. We live together. She lives with me. I mean, same thing. I can't help but find his hand movements on the water bottle gravely disturbing. Do you have kids? She has a kid. How old? Boy, girl? Boy. Boy. You have a good relationship with him? Yeah. So they're at home? Right now? Yeah. Okay. How many computers do you have in your home? One. Do you all use it? Yeah. Do you, uh, do you have it? set up where you only have places that you can look and then they have places that they can look or how's it set up? Yeah, I just keep my password. Okay. Kind of walk me through how you get on your computer. Like if you go in and you turn it on, is there a button that you push for Travis? Or I have a password that I go in on Yahoo myself. Mm -hmm. And that's basically it. But not the computer itself. It's not password protected. Just Yahoo. When you
you access Nobody Yahoo? Nobody really gets on the internet but me. And she does things with it, like crafts and things like that. Okay. Does she know uh, you chat? Yes, but she didn't know about this. So I told her it was a couple. A couple? A couple. A couple of what? Oh, Detective Reed. A couple of what? You must have been a comedian in a previous life. A couple, two people, a man and a woman. That, that you were coming to see? Yeah. For what? I have pleasure with couples. So she knows that you travel to have relationships? Yeah, but that's, I really don't want her life to be ruined either, you know? So. She's okay with that? With you traveling to have relationships with other people? We got together and we knew. I knew she knew what was hap what happens, but Does she participate sometimes? She has. Um how often? Not very often, just sometimes. When we first met she did but she likes to be with me, but now Probably won't be with me at all. Nobody will. Okay, well, you know, you're in a serious situation here. I'm not going to kid you and tell you you're not, but now we all make mistakes and we're all human and, uh, well, you know. That's my job already. If I don't show up, I guess, anyway. So, I mean, you know. Well, were you supposed to work tonight? No, I work in the mornings. Yeah. Well, you may. I have some explaining to do uh, when you get when you get out. Uh, but you know, it's nothing that you won't live through. Yeah. Now, I'd, I'd like to help you here if I can. You know, if I can get information from you that helps us get to the truth. There's not uh, really anything to say but what I told you. That's it. Okay. Now, have you been in trouble in the past for the there same was, behavior? There was a girl that I was dating. She gave me a fake ID. She was tall at the time. It was kind of like, uh, basically, I was up there in Delaware, and I was working, and she was at a job, and we met. We was had our time, and... She got in trouble, and she had to tell everything she did. I don't know, I guess they just asked her everything she did the days before that. And we broke up, and next thing I knew, um, I, I left to go back to North Carolina, where I was at, and the Delaware State Trooper uh, told my dad, and, and basically my whole family was involved. And, and How old were you? Was, I think 22. And how old was she? It said it was 18 on the, um, on the ID. At this point, it appears that Detective Reed begins to take a more confrontational approach to the interrogation, calling Travis out on his story that does not make much sense. She has gone along with most of what he has said so far, and it's a welcome change to the pace of the whole thing, as she asks some pertinent questions that I would like to ask him myself. But I think you always get ID me. from your girlfriends to see how old they are? Well, that was, uh, that was my first time being with somebody that I needed to know. But I was well, uh, was help fake. me understand how this went down. Did you say, hey, let's have sex, but I need to see your ID first? Because well, that's the way first. I'm hearing it. I asked her about her ID first before I started going with her. Because she's tall, but she looked young. I, I was younger then. <laughs> Travis, it sounds like you've gotten yourself in one bad situation after another. That was an accident. This is something I caused. Okay, so before you didn't feel like that you could have prevented. No, because I thought I was t I was in the right. You know. How long had you old. dated her? I think a couple of weeks, three weeks, four weeks or so. Okay. 
But then I went so back. what happened with that? Did you get charged and convicted? Um, pled to a lesser charge of having sex with a minor, but I never did the the other things. You know what I mean? The here there was three counts, and I, ne I never done the other two, but um, I played the one, and, and they dropped two. So okay, you, you're gonna have to explain to me what this and this means, cause I I'm I'm lost. I'm okay. Oral. Oral. And anal. And anal. I you said there it. were three. Yeah, and charges. I guess the kissing part was the third one. I don't know. They charged you for kissing. No, I, I don't know the third one. Oh. Whatever so was. did you have a criminal record after mm -hmm. that? Yeah. I still find it baffling to think that Travis has forgotten so many details about such an important conviction in his life. The next few minutes Travis will explain why his probation was revoked, which I'm fast forwarding because it's rather uneventful and has no relevance to why he was caught tonight. Yeah, time served, that's what it was. Okay. What about any other charges? Traffic tickets? Oh yeah, well, that usually. Anything else? I actually have one. I gotta go to November seventh. Uh, I was passing in a double lane to go to go to work. I was gonna pay the ninety dollars and go to court and see if we can reduce it down, but I won't make that one. I don't guess. Um, any other charges? Drugs? No, uh, do drugs. Criminal mischief. Nothing. What type of computer do you own? Uh, Windows Vista. Windows Vista. Okay. What kind of computer is it? Is it uh, Dell or it's Gateway, Compact? Aspire, Aspire, I think. Okay. Is it a laptop or a desktop? Laptop. Laptop computer? What else do you have at your house? Do you use a webcam? I had one, yeah. You have a webcam? What about a digital camera? Yeah, I had one. Okay. And uh, what about any pornography? Yeah. What kind of pornography, Travis? We enjoy uh, together some things. And there's sites that uh, be able to pop up during the time that you look other things and that pops up too other things what other things um young girls and there we have it this man fantasizes about sex with a minor he will obviously go on to try to explain why there may be traces of cp on his computer and for anyone with half a critical mind you will not believe a word of what he says. Anyone that can engage with that sort of content has a severe lack of empathy for their fellow human. That style of video is abuse in every form of the word, and for a person to sit there and enjoy it would require one to be truly deranged. This man is a predator through and through. But that's, that's, I guess that's what probably, you know, thwarted the thing. So you and your wife both look at child pornography? No, no, no. Just you? Yeah. I mean, no, no I don't. I don't even have any of that. You know what I mean? You have to. I don't. I don't go looking for that stuff. No. Okay. Will it be on your computer though, where you have seen it? I don't know if you really call it a child pornography site. There's no sites I've been to. It's just a bunch of videos, you know. And don't tell how old they are or anything like so that. So you enjoy young girls? Detective Reed just cutting through the crap with that comment. I've never been with a young girl except for that one that was 18. That's the only one young girl I've been with. And a daddy one. And she stayed with me for a while, but she never worked. So, I mean, she went back home. When was this? About 2001 or two. How old was she? 18. She was of age. I Where'd she go back home to? Uh, I'm not sure. You don't know where she lived? 
She, she lived, lived with you? She lived in Lebanon with her mom, and then she moved out on her own. I don't know. I, that was just... What was her name? I don't remember that either. That memory is really failing Travis on these important subjects tonight. You lived with this girl, and you didn't know her name. I've had a lot of girlfriends. Well, I'm sure you have, Travis, I but know. I want to know this one's name. I don't know. Now, I feel like you've been very honest with me so far. I am. But for some reason... I don't know her name. I really don't. Well, I want you to think about her name. I'm sure if you give it a shot, you can come up with a name for me. But she was of age. What's it matter there? Because I want to know her name. Hmm. I can see her face, but I just, I can't picture her name. How long did she live with you? A couple months. And you don't do drugs? Mm. What about the boy that lives with you? The five-year-old? Strictly friend. My, my girlfriend's son. He's your friend? I'm, I'm just saying we have a friendly relationship just like my son. You know what I mean? You understand my concern. Yeah, all these questions will pop up, I understand. And the more truthful you are now, the less you'll have to deal with later. Yeah, all I can tell you is I'm, I'm a good father to him, and I made a mistake, and I come down here. And I try to live life, I try to work hard. I made a mistake, that's all I can say. It's going to cost me probably my everything. I do ever so slightly feel for Travis here. The reason being is that humans are complex creatures. No matter how simple they may seem on the outside, there's a lot going on on the inside. I think this man probably does work very hard, and he probably does try to be a good person. He likely tries to live a normal life and have consensual fun to forget his problems and unwind. Some people play sports, other people are artists, and some people have consensual sex. I'm not here to judge how people live their lives. The unfortunate fact of the matter is that some people will grow into this world with an attraction to minors. That doesn't automatically make them a bad person. It's how they handle that attraction which will decide that fact. The mistake that Travis made here was not only coming to visit this decoy, but not seeking help earlier. Instead of trying to control his fantasies, he decided to feed into them by viewing illegal material online and ultimately making the decision to try solicit this minor for sex. He made a huge mistake and he will pay. It's his recognition and ownership of this fact that lends a small part of my sympathetic side to him in this moment. So where do you work? Parthenon Metals in Lebanon, I mean Laverne, Tennessee. Parthenon? Metals? Is it steel? Yeah. What was the city again? Laverne. Laverne. Yeah. Just like Laverne and Shirley? Yeah. That was a great show, wasn't it? It's okay. That and happy days. It appears as though Detective Reed is satisfied with the interrogation, as she's now entertaining herself with thoughts of television shows. The rest of the interrogation involves the detectives wrapping up and getting ready to move Travis out of the room. Overall, I think that Travis was one of the more dangerous men caught in the To Catch a Predator stings. Using the material that has been made public, Travis did not express a single shred of empathy towards the child, or any children for that matter. He never states that he understands why his actions were wrong, and further indicates an attraction to minors with the discovery of CP on his computer. 
Travis displays a high sex drive by seeking multiple partners and sexually enhancing devices like love swings that are installed in his bedroom. The danger of this sort of person is enormous. The more he engages with his sexual desires online, the more desensitized he will become to the emotional impact that these acts may have. This is commonly seen in people who have an addiction to sexual content. The more frequently they watch it, the more intense and hardcore that content needs to be for them to reach satisfaction. It is a dangerous cycle. For the most part, when people engage in consensual sexual activity with each other, there is no problem. But when one's desire involves that of a child, then we have a major problem. This is what we see in Travis. It is beyond lucky that Chris Hansen and the police were at that house rather than an actual child. Although these tapes are quite old, they are still very relevant in today's day and age. Times change and society does evolve, but the sexual deviancy of men seems to be a constant staple in our civilization's history. The scenario that is depicted here can be taken, studied, and applied to current societal situations, hopefully assisting in educating children, parents, and potential predators, thus preventing and putting a dampener on crimes against minors.